Well, hello again, Spring Lake Village. This is Nick speaking. As you know, um, I had intended to devote the entire month of October to this series of contested presidential elections just in time for the November 3rd election, which is very quickly um, approaching. But unfortunately, um, the evacuation, so we had to experience um, sort of upended uh, the month of October. So I'm not sh quite sure at this point how many of these lectures we'll be able to uh, cover um, before the November 3rd election, but hopefully um, a number of them, and we may have to extend this lecture uh, series into the uh, first week or two of uh, November. Um, in any case, um, I do hope uh, you did, uh, you were with me for lecture uh, number one, understanding uh, the Electoral College, uh, that rather remarkable system that was uh, put in place by the Founding Fathers. Um, it is, of course, how we elect our president uh, every uh, four years. So as you well know, um, many uh, political pundits um, expect this upcoming election uh, to be very controversial. It may in fact end up being uh, a contested election. We'll just uh, have to see how it uh, plays out on election night and uh, the days um, thereafter. But you should know um, that there were some extremely uh, controversial uh, elections in our history and um, perhaps the most a uh, notable one uh, took place in uh, 1800, uh, the election uh, in which Thomas Jefferson uh, went up against John Adams for the second time. The two were rivals uh, during the uh, 1796 uh, election. Now the Founding Fathers, um, when they uh, drafted the U.S. Uh, Constitution, had more or less envisioned a presidency as a position above uh, regional and political uh, disputes. They understood that disagreements were inevitable in a democratic uh, republic, but they also saw the president's role as a kind of conciliator who tried to bring uh, people together despite their uh, disagreements. Well, very early on, um, nothing could be further from the truth because these elections became very heated. And as you will discover, they were far more fiery, uh, far more uh, politically divisive, far more uglier than anything we have seen in recent years. Even this current election cycle, um, what uh, has been transpiring between the opposing sides, you know, some of the ugly rhetoric um, that has um, erupted, erupted between the two sides really pales in comparison to the kind of political diatribes and nastiness um, that uh, in many ways um, characterize the very controversial uh, election of uh, 1800. So let's uh, spend the next 30 or 40 minutes then um, exploring this um, very divisive uh, election uh, that took place um, in 1800. So during the um, late 18th century, already there was a great um, division uh, within the framework of the, uh, this very nascent political system that had been devised only a few years uh, earlier. It was described as the baneful effects of uh, political um, parties. George Washington, more than anything else, um, de deplored political parties and factional factionalism, competing political groups in government, uh, which he believed to be selfish special interests that would, as he, said would open the door to foreign influence and corruption. So he really uh, very much disapproved of uh, political parties.
So uh, throughout the uh, 13 original states, the former 13 colonies, um, there was a lot of fiery debate uh, regarding the fate of the uh, young republic, whether or not it would survive in this uh, horrible climate of political uh, div divisiveness. Um, as you know, George Washington's um, Secretary of State, uh, Thomas Jefferson, was very fearful of the emergence of sort of a monarchical government. Um, he had spent his life uh, uh, decrying a, a kind of kingly system of uh, government over Republican uh, principles. He very much uh, feared the rise of the so-called uh, Federalist Party, whose leader was um, Thomas uh, Jefferson. The uh, Federalists, um, again led by uh, Alexander Hamilton, had advocated a federal government that would assume the state's revolutionary war debts. He also had advocated for the establishment of a national bank and policies that aided manufacturers in New England and, and New York City. Federalists believed in a very robust, strong central government, a right to vote limited to men with property only, so a very sort of small uh, franchise, only men who were propertied, and um, you know, economic policies that gave the federal government tremendous powers at the um, expense of the states. Meanwhile, uh, Jefferson and his party, the so-called uh, Democratic uh, Republicans, advocated for a limited central government and uh, strong states' rights. Um, he had kind of a, an ancient Roman Republican uh, view of this American system of government. He envisioned the United States as a country of small farmers and artisans empowered uh, with the right to vote, formed around the leadership of, um, you know, this sort of agrarian view, this Jeffersonian principle of what good government um, should look like. So Jefferson's uh, form of democratic Republican, republicanism was grounded on a wholesale rejection of monarchical and aristocratic uh, rule. Above all, he believed in the supremacy of individual rights and the sovereign, sovereignty of the individual states as um, laid out by the US Constitution. John Adams represented to him the antithesis of his uh, Jeffersonian principles. And he saw um, in uh, John Adams during his administration, which began in 1797, as nothing more than a subversion of the U.S. Uh, Constitution. He even believed that uh, the Federalist view of government would lead to uh, a, a second revolution and the unraveling of the young republic. So, um, as you can see, the language of the day is um, very hyperbolic, very colorful, supercharged uh, rhetoric, um, you know, the kind of uh, invective and barbs hurled at one another, um, again, was uh, very excessive. Um, something even today we would find uh, rather remarkable and um, very difficult uh, to sort of reconcile. So for example, uh, Jefferson considered um, the current Federalist tenure under John Adams as a reign of witches. Um, notice here, these are the famous Three Witches in Shakespeare's uh, Macbeth. Um, he was very fearful that uh, individuals 
like uh, Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury under John Adams, sort of exemplified this this horrible uh, idea of overweening uh, government. Uh, you know, Hamilton's uh, plan to allow the federal government to assume uh, the nation's debt debts um, he found just unconscionable and. But as we know, that actually turned out to be um, uh, a very far-sighted uh, policy financial uh, directive that, in fact, proved to be uh, beneficial uh, for the young uh, republic. But he was very fearful that a new kind of muddied aristocracy was emerging under um, the Federalist uh, Party. He was um, very much afraid that the system of checks and balances enshrined in the Constitution uh, would collapse. And um, the Federalists had shown uh, very uh, pro-British uh, tendencies. Um, so for example, um, the treaty uh, negotiated uh, by John Jay seemed to um, reveal the, the sort of pro-British um, leanings of the government. I mean, after all, it was the British uh, reign, the, the British monarchy. We had thrown off the shackles of, um, of British rule. And, and here you find the Federalist Party sort of very reactionary and uh, sort of once again, um, sort of embracing the uh, idea of sort of a monarchical form of government. Jo Jefferson, um, a copious writer, um, was very, very worried uh, what was uh, transpiring uh, already in uh, the spring of 1796. Um, in one of his letters to a friend, Philip Mazet, he wrote, in place of that noble love of liberty and Republican government, which carried us triumphantly through the war, namely the Revolutionary War, what is emerging is an Anglican, monarchical, and aristocratic party whose avowed object is to draw over us the substance as they have already done the forms of the British um, government. Jefferson had really hoped um, that some kind of reconciliation uh, would have transpired between the two factions, but um, this um, quickly um, faded away. So on the eve of the uh, campaign of 1800, we find a very, very, very divided uh, government. So there were um, a number of explosive uh, issues um, the, that divided the two sides, namely the Federalists on the one hand and the uh, Democratic uh, Republicans uh, on the other hand. So uh, one revolved around um, what the U.S. position uh, stance should be regarding um, the French Revolution, which had erupted some 11 years earlier in 1789. Um, there were growing tensions um, with France, um, which of course, France had supported the Americans during the Revolutionary War. Uh, so many of the ideas of the Enlightenment that were enshrined in the U.S. Constitution had um, found birth in the uh, ideals of the uh, French Enlightenment. So Jefferson in particular, um, who had strong ties with France as minister to France, years earlier was um, very sympathetic uh, to the France co French cause. Meanwhile, <clears throat> the Federalists, as I mentioned, um, uh, favored uh, Britain. The Federalists um, believed that the trajectory of the French Revolution um, had gone much too far, it was very uh, radicalized at this point, uh, which uh, was was true, and uh, there was sort of an isolationist uh, 
viewpoint on the part of the Federalists to not become entangled with um, the power politics of the uh, French uh, Revolution. On the other hand, as I mentioned, uh, the Democratic uh, Republicans um, were very fearful of the Federalist Party's uh, pro-British uh, uh, stance, and uh, Adams was um, accused of being a traitor to the American Revolution, uh, one who uh, wanted to assume more and more authority, again, in the manner of a despot, if you will, sort of like a George III of England. Uh, and the Democratic Republicans um, uh, had reason to worry with the passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts just two years uh, earlier, which had been signed into law in 1798. Under the uh, Alien and Sedition Acts, um, recent uh, immigrants um, who wanted, it was, it became increasingly difficult for recent immigrants to become uh, U.S. Uh, citizens. And the uh, even more loathsome to the Democratic Republicans was the Sedition Act, which, um, kind of stifled or censored um, opposition to the Federalists. Um, it would criminalize false statements that were critical of the U.S. This was seen on the part of Jefferson as directed against the Democratic Republicans, uh, their vitriol and sharp criticism of Adams and the Federalists. This was seen as a way of, suppress of suppressing uh, free speech, etc. So, as a result of these sort of repressive measures, um, the uh, two sides were uh, very, very much at odds, as you might uh, well imagine. So, it was indeed a very uh, bitter election, each side believing uh, that the other was going to upend and overthrow uh, the U.S. Constitution. Now, for the most part, um, the Democrat Republicans um, were well financed, uh, well arg organized, and um, pretty effective in their um, campaign slogans and sort of their get out the vote. Uh, the Federalist Party had a rift and between uh, John Adams and uh, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton, although he'd been Secretary of Treasury, um, pretty much hated Adams um, at this point. He even wrote a very long missive in which he just derided and denounced uh, John Adams. And um, it very much um, <clears throat> hurt the uh, Federalist um, campaign. Um, there were all sorts of... Um, accusations uh, being launched um, by both sides. Um, one of the um, sad results, of course, was that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, these towering figures, um, these great framers, uh, founding fathers, who had at one time, at one time been uh, great friends, uh, were now uh, bitter rivals, uh, bitter uh, enemies. Um, their friendship would not be um, repaired, or this uh, friendship would not be repaired until uh, many, many uh, years later. So this uh, bitter campaign would be played out in the press. Um, you know, there were all sorts of newspapers, pamphlets, and again, um, a lot of these surviving primary sources revealed just the, the anger and the venom on the part of uh, each side. Again, um, I mean, even though a lot of were uh, were kind of repulsed by a lot of the uh, negative campaigning that goes on today, I think uh, it, again it really kind of pales um, in comparison to the kind of just bitter enmity and uh, just uh, very bitter and divis divisive uh, diatribe and invective that. Um, 
took place um, during the uh, election of uh, 1800. So um, in the uh, election of uh, 1800, again, you had um, two political factions. Uh, you had uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson and Aaron Burr, uh, the leaders of the Democratic Republican Party pitted against the Federalists, John Adams and Charles Pickney. So Burr was the running mate of Jefferson, Pickney the running uh, mate of uh, John Adams. Uh, each of these parties, as I mentioned, use just hyperbolic um, invective and rhetoric against uh, the other. And it even um, entered into the realm of attacking the religiosity of uh, either opponent. So we find the Federalist uh, and president of Yale, uh, the Reverend Timothy Dwight, just eviscerating uh, Jefferson, uh, calling him an atheist, uh, somebody, um, if he came to power, we would see a regime whereby we might behold a strumpet Personating a goddess on the altars of Jehovah. Now, this is an, a direct allusion to what was going on in revolutionary France, in which we saw prostitutes uh, being paraded uh, through Notre Dame, uh, you know, the cult of reason, etc. So, uh, the Federalists very much feared that uh, a Jeffersonian win would uh, translate into sort of an ugly kind of a French revolution in America. And again, uh, we know Jefferson was a deist. Um, he did consider himself a Christian, but his idea of God was more based upon sort of a scientific uh, construct that we get with uh, the Age of en Enlightenment. Um, Hamilton, meanwhile, <clears throat> was attacking John Adams, even though a Federalist, um, member of the Federalist Party, uh, on a personal level, as well as um, politically. And Hamilton believed that Adams in the end would uh, sell out and actually um, establish some kind of uh, uh, alliance uh, with France, as well as the Democratic uh, Republicans, and even a tried at some point to replace Adams with, with another uh, Federalist leader. Again, he, he thought Adams was an extreme egotist with a violent temper, and those um, characteristics of Adams, in fact, were um, actually quite accurate, and uh, these defects in his personality in no small way would lead to his uh, defeat in the election of uh, 1800. So the Electoral College, as it was divided, had some flaws in it, some weaknesses that would um, op open the door to sort of manipulation in the final uh, vote count. So each of the parties anticipated that the race would be uh, very, very tight. Uh, but each of the states um, was free to determine the time and the method for choosing its electors to the Electoral College. The election itself would last from April until uh, December of uh, 1800. And the Constitution as you know, um, determine the electoral college based upon the number of representatives from each state plus two senators. So each state had uh, two electors based upon two senators and its additional electors were based upon uh, population. The um, Electoral College uh, necessarily ass assumed that each of the states would use a system in which voters in each district would choose um, the electors. But in fact, the um, 
U.S. Uh, Constitution did not uh, spell that out. So you have sort of different sort of uh, system for choosing electors, um, sort of different systems uh, emerging in uh, each of these states. So we find um, Virginia, New Hampshire, for example, modifying their system of selecting their electors in, in an effort to favor one um, candidate. So you also might have a winner-take-all scenario or statewide ballot or specifying or each of the state legislatures would pick their uh, electors individually. Um, and a state legislature therefore could guarantee that its preferred candidate would receive all of the state's electoral votes. So the electors would cast their ballots um, in their individual states um, in uh, early December. And um, after ballots were cast, Jefferson's Democratic Republicans um, emerged victorious, but it was close, 73 to uh, 65. One of the um, key drivers uh, in that result, one of the factors which assured the success of the Democratic Republicans is that Aaron Burr of New York was successful in obtaining all 12 electoral votes uh, from uh, New York. And Aaron Burr assumed as a result of um, his efforts that he would be um, selected as vice president. Another important factor was the controversial um, three-fifths clause to the United States Constitution in which slaves were given a three-fifths vote um, in the uh, population count. And as you know, heavy slave population in the Southern states, so that gave a decided advantage to the Southern states by the addition of the three-fifths clause. In fact, if that clause had not been inserted into the Constitution, John Adams would uh, no doubt have won. And so in the aftermath of the election, the Federalists claimed that the Democratic Republicans rode to victory um, into the Temple of Liberty upon the shoulders of slaves. So you can see here the uh, breakdown of the electoral vote. So these green states went to Jefferson and Burr. You can see the electoral count number. Notice of uh, Pennsylvania split. Uh, eight votes went to the Democratic Republicans and seven votes uh, went to the Federalists. Same is true in North Carolina. So um, Jefferson won virtually, you know, all of the uh, Southern states as well as all important um, New York. Uh, meanwhile, Adams and Pickney, the Federalists won uh, the whole of uh, New England, as you can see here. Um, but again, uh, as I mentioned, we find um, as a result of this election, um, some flaws in the electoral college system. So since electors could not indicate a presidential or vice presidential cho choice, the result was a tie between Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. Um, the Constitution had laid out that each elector received two votes and that whichever can candidate obtained a majority of votes would be a president and then the second place vote getter would become vice president. But after 
all the vo votes were counted in the Electoral College. Um, Jefferson had 73 votes, but uh, so did Aaron Burr. Now, uh, Aaron Burr uh, had a fiery disposition. Um, he could be easily riled up. So um, the Democratic Republicans um, had failed in their efforts to arrange for at least one of the electors not to vote for Aaron Burr, thus assuring that Jefferson would have more electoral votes and therefore would win, and there wouldn't have been a tie. But uh, Burr may have man been responsible for uh, manipulation uh, behind uh, the scenes, but uh, that's sort of an uh, ongoing uh, controversy um, even today. So um, as laid out in the uh, Constitution, um, in the event of a tie in the Electoral College, it would fall to the House of Representatives to open, ultimately choose the uh, winners. So um, over the course of a week, the House would pass 34 ballots, and each time Jefferson received eight votes and Burr six. Uh, the representatives of Vermont and Maryland divided evenly and cast a blank ballot each time to maintain the majority requirement at nine. Um, a lot of the Federalists wanted to exploit um, the situation. They saw it as a chance to um, keep Thomas Jefferson from assuming um, the uh, presidency. So um, the Federalists still controlled uh, key House uh, delegations, and they were successful in blocking the election of Jefferson to the presidency for 34 roll call votes over some six days between uh, the 6th of February and the 16th of February in um, 1801. So the uh, Democratic Republicans were very fearful that the Federalists would steal the election um, from them and be successful in, uh, not, in, in voting in uh, a member of the uh, Federalist Party. There are some trepidation even um, now of, of how this election will be played out if in fact the House of Representatives um, would uh, determine uh, who would become who would be the uh, next president uh, in this election cycle. Be interesting to see how that will ultimately play out in the next couple of weeks. There was even a fear of armed resistance. Uh, Thomas Jefferson reportedly told John Adams um, that if there was any attempt to defeat the presidential election, it would be met with resistance uh, by force and incalculable uh, consequences. So we find many of the uh, Democratic Republican governors incensed and there were reports that some were ready to march with their militias if the Federalists in fact stole the election from Jefferson. In a letter to Thomas Jefferson, which is dated the 21st of March 1801, Governor Thomas McKean of Pennsylvania described his plan to use the Pennsylvania militia to arrest for treason anyone involved in what Jefferson had previously termed a usurpation. And in a letter to Governor James Monroe of Virginia, February 11th, 1801, Samuel Tyler observing the debate on Monroe's behalf told the governor that Pennsylvania already had 22,000 men ready to take up arms and that Virginia would be ready for action, including secession if the Federalists tried to steal the election. In response to such rumors, the Washington Federalists openly boasted that any effort by Republicans to use force against the Constitution would be met by 60,000 trained militiamen from Massachusetts who could easily defeat 
the untrained mob from Pennsylvania and Virginians practicing military maneuvers with uh, corn stalks. So fearing the uh, violence that uh, might ensue, Alexander Hamilton actually now supported uh, Jefferson. Um, so even though he was not a big uh, friend of Jefferson, he had a lot of distrust of Jefferson, uh, label him even a contemptible hypocrite. Um, he didn't think uh, a Jeffersonian government would undermine the government and adopt, as he called it, a violent uh, system. But he was fearful of Burr, whom he believed had was very ambitious and lacked principle, public um, or private. So in the end, on the 36th vote, uh, 36th ballot, um, with no Federalists voting in favor of Jefferson, Jefferson um, would emerge uh, triumphant on the 17th of February of 1801 and would be inaugurated our third president on the uh, 4th of March of that year. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, electoral college system um, would have to be modified. And this would uh, result in the uh, 12th Amendment to the uh, US uh, Constitution. So, as originally um, laid out, the, elect the electoral college had stipulated that each um, elector could cast his ballot, not for two people in the same state as the elector. The candidate, um, as we mentioned, with the most electoral votes would become president, and the second would become vice president. That's how it had uh, been originally envisioned. And again, in the event of a tie, the uh, House of Representatives would choose the president. That's how it exists even um, today in the event of a tie. Uh, normally adjudicated in the House of Representatives. Uh, but as mentioned, um, in 1803, uh, Congress proposed a 12th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and it specifically stipulated now that each elector must cast distinct votes for president and vice president instead of the two votes for president. This then put in place measures that would reduce any chance of an opposing party in the um, role of vice president. Um, and it also kept the clause in place forbidding an elector from voting for both candidates of a presidential ticket if both candidates are from the elector state. Still, if um, electoral college majority is not reached, um, the House of Representatives will choose the president from the three highest receivers of electoral votes. So this amendment was ratified um, by majority uh, the following year in 1804. So um, it is an inaugural uh, address. Thomas Jefferson dubbed the election of 1800 as a revolution. He called it the revolution of 1800 uh, because as he envisioned it, political power had transferred um, peacefully from one political party, namely um, the Federalist, to another, that is the uh, Democrat Republicans. The ultimate victory of the more Democratic Republicans. The victory of the uh, Republican Party would foreshadow the expansion of voting rights in the following years. Jefferson was uh, reelected in 1804, defeating uh, Charles Pickney. Uh, remember, he had been um, Adams' running mate in the election of 1800. He would run again in 1808 and lose to um, Madison. 
and the Federalists eventually would um, would uh, fall by the wayside to the trash heap of history, if you will. Um, never again winning a presidential uh, election, um, especially after their opposition to the uh, War of 1812 with Great Britain. So Jefferson was um, quite conciliatory um, in his inaugural address on the 4th of March, 1801, declaring, we are all Republicans, that is Republicans with a little r, and we are all Federalists. Um, and again, um, he continued that uh, belief that the election of 18 hundred was a revolution. It was as real as a revolution in the principle of our gov government as that of 1776 was in its form. Not affected indeed by the sword as that, but by the rational and peaceable instrument of reform and the suffrage uh, of the people. So um, again, even though the Federalist Party would eventually die out, a number of its uh, most famous ideas and uh, policies of how government should be organized, especially uh, regarding a central robust uh, federal government, centralized government, these still um, lived on. Um, the idea of a financial credit um, for the uh, to assure the stability of the United States, the idea of a national bank, uh, these kind of rights that were not enumerated in the U.S. Constitution um, over time uh, were embraced and, um, of course, live on even today. Uh, as you know, Aaron Burr uh, became uh, aware of the behind the scenes uh, power politicking on the part of Hamilton, and the two would meet on a fateful uh, day uh, in 1804 when Aaron Burr challenged Alexander Hamilton to a gun duel. Uh, as you know, Burr shot Hamilton. It was a fatal blow. He died. Um, the following uh, day from that wound. Meanwhile, uh, John Adams um, returned to Boston after losing the 1800 election and he would not run for office um, again. I mentioned earlier that these two great figures had been friends um, during the early years of the Republic, very close friends, great intellectuals, but that election had very much split them apart. Happily, they renewed their friendship, especially, you know, epistle writing. They wrote a lot of letters to one another, and um, a friendship was once again reestablished. Uh, as you know, interestingly, um, both would die on July 4th, 1826, exactly 50 years to the day after the signing. Um, of the Declaration of Independence. So very interesting um, how contentious uh, the election of 1800 really was. Um, and next week uh, we'll explore another very uh, controversial uh, election, the election of uh, 1824. So I look forward to seeing you again. Um, take care until we're, uh, we meet again. So. Bye for now.